you were with us last Tuesday, um, you know that we what we were doing. But I'm going to pull the mask down so that I can project a little better. Last week, Tuesday at this time, we were working on gravity and Hot Wheels. And we got such a riveting and marvelous conversation going on after that that I thought we'd bring it back and and briefly review what we did last week, but also bring some new ideas in. Um, this week, we're going to look at... Uh, acceleration ballistic uh, courses that these these uh, objects will take and we're going we're going to mention g forces because i think that's something that's uh, that bears uh, talking about since we've got all these non-commercial or commercial flights going into outer space or near outer space let's just talk about what what that is when we get there so the notion here is that it, our first proving point was that if we set this is a little physics device that sets these two balls to go at the same point now this one's going to shoot out here parabolically and land somewhere over there, both affected by gravity, and this one's going to go straight down. And the question we start out with is which one hits first? This one has a, a, a further course to take, but there's a little bit of surprise if you didn't tune in last week, and you can go back and review that show if you want. But the, but the thing pulling it down is the force of gravity, and on Earth here at this place in the universe, it's about 32 feet per second squared. And what that actually means is that in the first second, at the end of the first second, the, uh, the ball will be going 32 feet per second downward towards the center of the Earth, which it'll never reach because it'll hit the floor here or the ground outside. But in the second second, after the second second, it'll be going 64 feet per second and then 96 onward and onward and onward until we hit terminal velocity. And that's the point at which we can't pick up any more speed because the atmosphere is essentially holding us back. All right, so the question I pose is, which one hits the ground or the floor in here first? And I have to remind last week's team, if any of you are with us, you know, that our ears can actually hear faster than our eyes can see. And you might go, wait a minute, that doesn't quite make sense because uh, sound travels at about 750 miles an hour or so, and light goes a whole lot faster, 180,000 um, plus miles per second. So, but let's just tell you that the ear is, is built for a warning device and the eye sort of builds a picture that's about a hundredth of a second long. So that's one of the reasons it has to do with our brain and the way we view. So listen to hear if these two balls strike at the same time. My ear thought they were pretty close. And uh, you know, in these distances, it sounded pretty close. Now it didn't matter if we changed the speed at which it, it came off of here, we were able to determine that. Now, another thing we did last week, and if you want to see this, we're not going all the way through this mathematically, is we determined the speed of a car, for instance, leaving this chamber here by knowing the acceleration of gravity. We could measure this parabola, or at least the distance from the drop, because we proved over here that the second, the moment more so, said it leaves this platform it begins to drop down even though it's moving that way the same thing happens here the moment it leaves the edge of the track it starts falling it makes pretty clear sense that the faster we go the further out we'll get and that's why when you shoot a bullet out of a gun it doesn't feel like it goes falls down much because it's going so fast that by that you can't see its fall much at all so one of the things we wanted to put together last week to show oh gosh these were not set by me is when we could pull off essentially the four car salute and the four car salute is to show that all four cars are going at the different four set points on my on my launcher here and in so doing they should each land out here at a different spot now this is going to be a lot going on all at once and so stay tuned watch it you might have to slow down the video Hold it. Hold it. I'll... This is an important moment where you actually show the car. So I'm going to zoom Move it in. So we're going to, so it, 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 we should re familiarize you with the device. I'm going to pull this extra one back here. And what this is, this is a spring loaded device, but it has three, one, two, three, four different click points. That's further and that's faster. That's less and not as fast. So what we wanted to show in our four car salute here is that indeed we should get a, 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 in our, a diff, different, four different arcs from these cars because they should have four different speeds coming off of here based on the tension on that binder. Are we in, are we in, we in are. zoom on, right? 
Let's examine the cars too. Oh, okay. Let's talk about the cars. We have the the Batman the physics camera. set, which are these the matched set of cars. They're all the same. And uh, I should mention this about Hot Wheels cars. Those of you Hot Wheel experts, you know that the first day of the car is the fastest day of the car. Um, after that, it starts crashing into things. The wheels and their axles start to get marred up. And so there are efficiency um, problems that exist. So the first day is usually the fastest day. Um, I suppose you could do something on day two to make them go faster, but that's not really what we're talking about here. Um, so each of these cars have had a history, and we actually took, uh, when we were busy into this, we took track of their history, and so if we saw a car that was not performing as well, why well, we took it out of the set, and I think we had to remove at least one or two. So let's run the car salute here, now that we've seen and been in here. And again, we're promoting even hotter wheels because our wheels are gonna be going uh, four cars simultaneously. And uh, I think this bears a count back. So why don't you give me a five, five. four, three, two, one, go. Five. I clearly saw four different distances here and I'm sure that, that we can check the video camera to see if indeed we got four different distances. Now that was something, that was sort of some, some leftover makeup work from last week. And uh, again, we were able to determine speeds of about six to eight, five miles per hour, which doesn't seem very fast, but remember it's going, they're going downward too. So we actually were probably picking up and we didn't go through that calculation, more speed downward than, uh, than we were getting outward so there were two speeds working for us there in that all right now let's let's go with this notion and explore this idea of g-forces i think there are two things first of all there's a movie called g-force that's not what we're, we're talking about here so if you guys were googling or looking for the movie g-force stay tuned and let's talk about physics what we're talking about g-forces are essentially the force of gravity at sea level so if i jump up and I never hit, I, I keep going downward, I keep falling. But when I do hit, I actually hit at about two to three Gs, which means the forces on my body, let's say I weighed 200 pounds, I weigh slightly more, but let's say I weigh 200 pounds, then my body's uh, essentially weight when it strikes will be somewhere around four to 500 pounds collectively through here. Well, if you're an astronaut, you're gonna undergo some G-forces. If you're a fighter pilot, you're gonna undergo some G-forces. And when these get really, really wildly high, and we're really not talking about that high, five plus, weird things start to happen. If you're going five plus Gs, in other words, your body, my 200 pound body, weighs about a thousand pounds now, I'm bearing some forces on it that I'm not really built to take. One of the things that does happen to a pilot flying at high Gs, taking a, a barrel or a loop roll, as the blood starts to move down to their legs. Well, that's nice for your toes, but your head is what's driving the plane, your arms. So if you don't have enough blood in your brain, you start to get woozy. Your, 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 your eyes and your head don't match. And a lot of people pass out at this place. And so it's a, it's a really interesting place in study. Now there's been some, some instances where people have taken some G-forces in the 20 plus, but only for a small amount of time. That's not a, a, a roll which takes at least 10 seconds to get around. So, so let's talk about that. But here, let's, let's look at G-forces here, and then we'll talk more about them as we go. So this loop is gonna have to allow us to have G-forces to keep going around the loop. Now, if we zoom down this track, and get to the loop and create one G, the car will go to the top and fall straight down. Well, the pilot doesn't wanna make halfway through the loop and start to drop. So we're trying to get at least two Gs here. So what we did earlier, and I'll have to get my gadget, and a little bit of the, the pilot testing on this, my, my assistant and I, and that was probably a different car, we should have calculated which one, but we'll see, decided where was the minimum amount of distance that we had to get in order to build, we tried to figure out where one G lied and we thought it was somewhere around 43, which is about right there. And this is where the, the loop essentially starts to fail. And we'll see, it kind of did a little schlocky fail there. Let's go a little bit lower. That car might've been a touch more efficient. And efficiency is important here because if the car were 100% efficient, this would be a straightforward calculation. It's about two and a half times higher than the than the than the uh, 
the circle of the loop to make it around. So I'm going slightly lower and we'll see. There's a 1G failure. Okay, so let's try 2Gs, which we know existed up here somewhere in the 60 plus range where we thought 2Gs was based on the efficiency of these cars, which we had pre-calculated to be about 70% on a good day, a bad day being the uh, winds blowing against us, the air pressure was wrong. Well, we don't have much wind in here. So let's try a, a full loop and a full G-force. We made it just around, that was about two Gs right there, right where we thought it was. And if we get anything more than two Gs, of course, that makes it uh, much more likely that we're gonna crash off the course than not make it around the loop. So up here at this point, we've got an easy round the loop make. So again, it makes sense that we have to try and establish at least two Gs, which meant the, the centripetal force outward had to be two gravities to overcome the force of gravity pulling down. That didn't stop just because we're trying to go around the loop. No, that has to happen because gravity keeps going. Now, before we get to our real play time where we set tracks all over the place and we, we run them off the balcony and stuff. Last week we talked about how these things, how this ballistic study was different in different parts of the universe or in our solar system just because we're more familiar with it. Now, on the moon, where the gravity is about one sixth, if we've got the same setup, it should take less distance up. So if we were at 42, it should be about a sixth of 42. Now we can't bring this thing to the moon today. Maybe we'll get a flight later on, we'll go over there. But we should be able to do that at about seven inches. In other words, we should be able to make it around there on the moon at about seven inches up, which is about a sixth of the gravity on Earth. And so you can see it doesn't even begin to go around. See if we can make sure we got that right. Yes, so we should be less on the moon. Now, if we bring our experiment up to Jupiter where we have a gas giant, a failed sun really, a failed star, and uh, so it's, it's not a solid surface, it's a huge planet, but it's only got about two and a half times more gravity than, uh, than we do here on Earth. So in order to make this loop, 42, oh my goodness, we're gonna need more track. Well, let's just do the calculation. I guess we could get the track. We're gonna to need to make this loop at least two and a half times 42, which was our minimum loop height. So 84 plus another half of 42, another 21. We're gonna to have to go about 100 with 84, 105 millimeters up, which is gonna be, here's 100 and then five, so up about here, just to make it on the sun is two and a half times further. So we're gonna be up about here in order to get a couple of Gs or just the one G, clearly makes it there, but that's one G, that was 42 or one G, 60 times two and a half was a 120 plus another 30, 150 millimeters to make a good happy round the loop, which is gonna be up about here. So difference, Differences make differences. In other words, planet size does affect the physics of that planet. We get so used to doing things on Earth that we forget sometimes when we go to other places, the rules are, are different in their ratios to effect. Now, since we're talking about space travel, let's talk about one of, what I think is one of the least understood notions, and it fits in with our G-Force uh, uh, discussion today. So a lot of people will fly to space. Now there was just a crew that came back and they went around the earth a few times. And um, I think some people on earth might've said, ah, oh, no gravity. Ha, huh, no. Gravity is not disappeared just because you're going around the earth. We've got gravity everywhere in the universe. What you've got is a, is a low gravity situation. It's actually only, you still have 5% of the gravity that you have on earth, which is a whole lot less. But that doesn't explain why you have weightlessness. Weightlessness happens because the, the, earth, the, the craft going around the earth is actually falling, like the earth. And I put my number down here earlier. Let's see if I can remember it here, I didn't. Oh, so, it's, so, so the spacecraft 
and the Earth are falling at about 18,000 miles an hour. So you're in space falling with the Earth, and that's where you get the weightlessness. So in free fall, you get that. Now, I hope your mind is starting to go, if you didn't recognize this before, ah, oh, I see, but I still, I want to prove that to myself. And here's how you prove that to yourself. You prove that to yourself in an elevator. When the elevator starts to go down, jump up. For a moment, you'll be going, you'll be in a weightless environment, but you're still tailored to the, the gravity of Earth, but the downward force or the downward path of the elevator will essentially escape you. And the G-forces that you gave up for your weightlessness will come back to you when you hit the ground floor because your little goal look kind of like that. So you didn't get any free Gs here. You just suspended the, the G-forces up here, which you picked up doubling more or so when you hit the ground floor. Now, if you jump up, when you get to the bottom, you're going to go, whoa, and you'll feel that G. It'll feel weird in a way that you often may not have felt G-forces before. All right. Well, that's today's show. Um, I feel like every high school physics teacher should have a classroom set of Hot Wheels. These are just some of the experiments we've done, we've done with Hot Wheels. Another reminder, when we were first making roller coasters, loops were more circular like this, and they were actually breaking people's necks on the G-forces that were developed right about here. The G-forces were up around four to five, and if you weren't back in your seat, your head went, ah! and it can sometimes do some damage to your, your spine and your neck. So, get your Hot Wheels kits. Go on, you physics teachers. Kids love this stuff. Teachers love this stuff. I have used this at every level from elementary to high school all the way up to uh, college physics. So, here we go. Headwater Science Center. Come on down and see us Monday through Saturday, 9.30 to 5, Sunday 1 to 5. We'll run some of these experiments. We'll run some other physics uh, ideas. Sometimes you got to feel it to believe it. 